the traditional way of doing marketing mix modeling is where you have a team of mathematicians. You're looking at a blend of your financial data, so how you're spending the money between various tactics. It's, it's taking into account certain uh, KPIs like traffic on the site, time on site, net promoter score, signups, whatever, whatever. Uh, and then it's building a mathematical model trying to replicate. Hello world, this is Better Tech, a podcast where we chat with some of the most successful leaders about the latest industry developments. So join us as we explore the world reliant on tech. This episode is brought to you by Texel, a leading software development company. Check them out at Texel.com. We're joined today by Christopher Engman, CMO at Proof Analytics and Haseeb Khan, Director of Technology at Texel. You're listening to Better Tech, and without further ado, let's hear from our guests. Thank you very much, Christopher, for taking out the time and talking to us about the topic today. My pleasure. Uh, I, I look forward to our discussion on, on uh, great innovations and thoughts around automation and AI in, in the marketing and sales space. That's awesome. So Chris, uh, before we start, why don't you go ahead and give a brief intro about yourself to the audience? Right. So, so uh, I, I started off as an entrepreneur. I built uh, a few different MarTech companies. Uh, I've sold them and I've, I, I'm now a very active investor. So I'm an investor in 14 companies. It's a combination yeah. of marketing and sales technology and also a few green kind of green energy companies and uh, I've also written a book called Mega Deals, uh, which is about multi-billion dollar deals based on quite a lot of research. Right. And I'm also, I run sales and marketing at Proof Analytics and we're the world leader in something called automated marketing mix modeling, working with um, a fast growing amount of, of very large uh, global corporations uh, and also some scale ups on how to optimize the marketing mix or the go-to-market mix to grow faster or make more higher profits. Right. So these days, like there is a lot of buzz and hype around the AI, machine learning, data science, and sort of its related uh, technology. So how do you see that it really matters to B2B companies? Because like there are two sides of it. One can be B2B, the other one can be B2C. So in terms of if we talk about uh, B2B more, what do you think that AI and its related uh, technologies matter to those businesses? Well, I, I think first of all, um, it, it's kind of, we're gradually, uh, so, so to take, take one step back, we, we can see when we run proof analytics on go to market mixes that, uh, that marketing or anything scalable is underinvested and there's an overinvestment in people. So we, we spend too much time, too much money on salespeople and we spend too little time on, mm -hmm. on anything scalable. And that's a mix of technology and marketing. So, so when we run regression analytics on those, we, we can see that that, that is a, there's a very much a delay in, in moving from, and being very sales driven to be more digital and marketing driven. And, and um, I've applied that, the new balance of it uh, in, in now two big cases. One, we went from three to $90 million in contracting in just two years where we applied a much heavier marketing than, than salespeople. Uh, and now at Proof Analytics, the same. So, so I've, I've seen this both based on research around the Megadis book, but also based on proof analytics where we analyze both B, big B2C and B2B companies, uh, mm -hmm. sales and marketing mixes. Now, th so that's kind of a macro trend and we, that, that will not slow down. So I think what will happen, you will have a much, uh, much fewer uh, salespeople, but much better. So you have a much smaller amount of salespeople and will be more and more backed by by anything scalable. Uh, and that, that also applies to a very large deal. So it's not just a B2C thing. It's also definitely a B2B uh, thing. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so that's kind of a, a general macro, macro observation. Uh, and uh, it's also what, what's also happening is that you see that the automated technologies are not just on the, 
a marketing side are not just there for lead generation. They also, so if you look at the whole customer journey, they're also infiltrating the journey along the way. So all the way to the deal closing. And then after the deal closing, how do we expand this account? So there are quite a few digital techniques like uh, uh, account based marketing, for example, uh, various social selling techniques that are infiltrating and also robots and chatbots and so forth, where you uh, chew up the simpler part of a, a sales journey, but sometimes also the more complicated ones like building business cases is sometimes done better by, by robots than by people. Right. So um, for AI, we have seen that it helps finding the correlations as well as some of the predictions, managing data points, broader personalization. And these are some, like some of the use cases. And another one is cutting down on overhead costs that you have just mentioned. So yeah. um, right now, you have touched on a couple of points where AI and machine learning is facilitating the operations of uh, B2B businesses. So yep. what in your experience you have seen, like what are some of the main things with, uh, which uh, AI and machine learning has uh, I mean, um, done for B2B businesses in terms of facilitating them? Well, uh, if I ask, answer more broadly B2B and B2C, so for example, my own area, uh, marketing mix modeling, which is a regression based, uh, so multi-regression based analytics where you determine what, in your marketing mix, you should increase, decrease, and sometimes take away. That has now been automated by a fair amount of, I mean, simple automation all the way to machine learning, which is, uh, which is what we've done. So we've reduced the time it takes to make those analysis with 90%. So, so all of a sudden, the time it takes to make the marketing mix modeling work is, is cut by more than 90%. And in some instances, way more than that. So not only does it allow the, uh, pretty complicated, often PhD mathematician driven, uh, marketing mix modeling, driving it from being done once a year or one, twice a year to being done every week or every month. And also not just looking at what's driving sales, but also looking at what's driving awareness, what's driving net promoter score, what's driving loyalty, what's driving mm-hmm. footfall in the stores, what's driving site visits. So, so we have more and more clients that all of a sudden run automated regression modeling uh, on various areas and they start off by looking at what's driving the sales numbers, but then they go much wider and they look at what's driving uh, right. happy or not happy clients in a store and same for the B2B side, like a net promoter score. So it's highly interesting. And all of a sudden with automated regression modeling, uh, you can all of a sudden use it so much more. And uh, so we have clients that are going towards having like over hundred multiple models uh, running in parallel. So every Monday when you come to work, you get a, you get a pointer. What is, what activities are now trending up and what are trending down? Um, where do we see an increase in standard deviation, et cetera? So, so, uh, but then package for our stakeholders. So all of a sudden you have a decision material that is not based on a few clicks here and there, but actually on regression modeling, which is very comprehensive and is catching right. anything offline, online, uh, and not just some a few online clicks uh, that simple right. attribution is using. So for our space, automation and machine learning uh, is, is making a tremendous impact. Uh, and we're kind of winning account by account now, now from the traditional players that are offering it as a consulting product like a Nielsen and Accenture and, and those companies. So we, we kind of take... Uh, account by account from them. And all of a sudden these companies can run something that is very mathematically heavy uh, on a global scale uh, per country, per brand, per BU, and a combination of all those. And before they could do a, a few analysis per year. Right. Um, so so that's a, that has a tremendous impact and it's all based on automation and machine learning. Um, right. In terms of, if we talk about uh, B2B businesses and B2C businesses, what in what in your opinion in the longer term will be sort of uh, uh, something which will stay for a longer period of time? So, for example, if we talk about B two C businesses, and there is a humongous amount of data already out there. So, if we take right. companies companies like Uber or companies like Spotify or companies like Walmart or like 
so those are like primarily some of them some i mean mostly p2c businesses which have a lot of customer data on which right. they can make your sort of apply ai or machine learning in a better way but in in terms of b2b businesses uh, i mean they are actually catching up and incorporating those things but uh, seems to be a bit slow so what do you think yeah. like uh, i mean what importance it would have for b2b businesses in the longer run and which one do you uh, see to stay for a longer time. Right. So there are a few areas. Well, I think it will be very dominant in both. But uh, in the B two B space, there are a few things that. Um, so, so if you if you think in three layers, this is what I think anyway. So the simplest stuff can be highly automated in the B two B context, and the most advanced stuff. So uh, relation relationship matters in the middle. Will uh, I think will. I mean, we will have less and less human interactions, but there's there's a trust layer in the middle where, especially when you do complex B2B deals that will be there forever and ever, I think, but we can surround some star salespeople with a lot of uh, technology and marketing. And on the high end of it, so the most complex stuff, for example, creating a, a, conf- a configuration of a, of a power plant or creating a business case for, let's, let's take a power plant as an example for a power plant. That is to a large extent better done by machines uh, mm-hmm. because the human brain can only handle four variables. Um, and in understanding and configuring a power plant, you might be up to 500 variables. So uh, whether that technology support is used in a meeting or on the web, it doesn't really matter, but it's machines are way better at handling multiple dimensions where you have, uh, I mean, as soon as you go above four variables, the human brain is just not very good. Uh, and uh, in, in anything, and this is also why marketing mixed modeling cannot be done by, with the human brain because we have too many variables and they have different time delays. And in a more technical environment, configuring a power plant might have quite a few variables. So it's not easily done in our head. So we need to have uh, uh, a lot of support there. Uh, so, so those configurations uh, can be at least semi-automated. Right. And, and so, I mean, the, the thing is, so the thing is, uh, uh, you know, when you talk AI, machine learning and automation are kind of three different degrees of, of intelligence, right? So I think many companies call uh, simple automation, they call it AI. And uh, that's, yeah. that's, why, that's why I'm just a bit careful sometimes to use exactly those terms because I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, because I do a lot of investments in, in scale-ups and a lot of them coming to me saying, yeah, we have this AI-based technology for uh, planting seeds. And then I go, oh, cool, what, what, what's the AI piece? And they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, we have automated this, this, and that. So what they mean is automation. And, and I, um, I kind of see it's a sliding scale of intelligence. So what, was, what is today called automation was 10 years ago called AI. And, 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 and all the way up to the gen- gen- general intelligence level, which is kind of the highest. I mean, we're not there yet. So we we're still using... AI, ML, and an automation on uh, kind of limited areas, which are not requiring the mental jumps, because this is where the human brain is better. We're not good at multiple dimensions, but we're better at associating, so we can jump mm-hmm. between domains much better than machines. But we're not very good. At, we're not very good at a high complexity within one domain. Uh, we, we typically right, are right. weaker on that. Um, right. As a frequent investor, I get a bit annoyed when companies are pretending to be AI yeah. and, and they're not. Uh, so I, I think it's just, uh, for me, it's all about various degrees of intelligent automation, regardless mm-hmm. if it's automation, machine learning, or AI. And within the AI space, it's specific all the way up to generic, and I mean, general intelligence. Right. Right. So you talked a lot about auto, um, automated marketing mix modeling, right? So yeah. if you can, if you can quickly sort of give a very high level and a summarized overview, like what it what it is and how machine learning is enhancing the automated marketing mix modeling. 
Right, right. So first to describe it, let's just put it in a context. So a lot of companies are right now trying to figure out what's working and not in their sales and marketing mix. And uh, the, the early attempts was to use various kind of visualization tools where you visualize the data. That doesn't really work uh, in, in a complex area because there are too many variables. Um, mm -hmm. Then a, a lot of companies are trying to follow some kind of attribution where they're trying to follow click patterns. Now, the issue with those is whether it's first click attribution or last click attribution or a multi-touch attribution, all of them have a few weaknesses. First of all, you can't, most of the interactions you cannot see because they're happening on the social media platforms. Uh, they're happening on mm -hmm. third party, uh, yeah, I mean, any kind of third party site or they're happening offline. And even if it happens online, it's very related to your own site. So what looks like a first touch is maybe the 47th touch. Uh, mm -hmm. And then during the buying journey, they, they might leave the site and look at the reviews on YouTube, et cetera. So, so trying to determine what's working and not based on only digital touch points is very weak. A lot of clients that we engage with uh, have gone down that path and they realize that their customer acquisition cost is gradually increasing despite themselves thinking that they're data driven. Uh, but they're right. optimizing on the too little data. So they're looking at too few touch points and trying to optimize towards that. So they become very heavy on search. They become very heavy on anything fast converting and they become very weak on anything with a slow effect. So marketing in marketing, delayed effects is a killer. It's, it's kind of a King Kong. And in any kind of attribution, you can't catch delayed effects. So they give you the wrong answer, basically. I have an example from a big watch brand uh, that's growing pretty fast. They, they were looking at, the marketing mix with a simple attribution and two activities were coming out as equally successful. Now, when you look at it with, uh, with a, a marketing mix modeling where you catch the delayed effects and the interaction effects between activities, mm -hmm. one of the two come out as 50 times stronger. So a 50 times higher ROI because the delayed effect uh, over time is so significant. Like if you look at a search ad, it, it have, has a very immediate effect, but it's, it's very short. So whereas a great video or a podcast, like something with a great content or a piece of a press release that stays a long time on, on the internet, it can have a pay, payoff over a very long time. Now, right. uh, so, so, so marketing mixed modeling is actually econometrics or regression analytics applied on marketing, but the marketing world is calling it marketing mix modeling. The traditional way of doing marketing mix modeling is where you have a team of mathematicians, you're looking at a blend of your financial data, so how you're spending the money between various tactics. It's, it's taking into account certain uh, KPIs like traffic on the site, time on site, net promoter score, signups, whatever, whatever. Uh, and then it's building a mathematical model trying to replicate. So let's say you're analyzing what's driving sales. And this is the, if you can see my hands here, this is the sales curve over time. Then we're looking at the various factors contributing to that, how much we spend on retargeting, search, all of that. Uh, and, and those are kind of small lines in the, underneath. You try to mathematically replicate your sales curve. So you try to create a formula, basically mm. remember from school, Y equals five times my investment on retargeting with the time of function with right. the, with the fun and then plus three times my investment into this uh, with a function of, with, with a, a function of time, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so you're modeling, you're trying to artificially recreate the sales curve and try, you try to explain it with a number of variables. And when you come right. close to the sales curve, then you, you, you realize which are the variables that are significant. You also realize what are the, the delayed effects because they're, factored in with a function of time, and you, you then replicate kind of the real sales curve synthetically. And then you know, okay, these are the 15 factors that really significantly contribute to sales. And then you know uh, these, and, and also you know how much they contribute. And the ones that contribute a lot, you can increase the spend on them. And the ones that contribute less, you can stay. And the ones that are not appearing as significant, you can probably shut them down, or at least analyze why they're not significant. So, and that's very mm -hmm. powerful. Now, now, this whole category, traditional marketing modeling, has been driven by large teams of mathematicians. So it's been staying. So if you look at the Fortune 1000 companies or the Fortune 500, mm -hmm. more or less all of them are using marketing mix modeling, but only on their main markets and only like one model per year or something where they try to analyze what's driving sales. Mm 
With the automated market mix modeling, you can, you can run it in minutes instead of weeks and months. You can run it in all your countries every week, every month, if you like, and you can run multiple models. You're not just looking at what's driving sales. You're looking at what's driving side traffic, what's driving that promoter score, what's driving X, Y, Z, et cetera, loyalty. So, so you're analyzing it faster and, and uh, in a wider sense. Uh, and that, that's the revolution of automated marketing mix modeling. And the good thing is that the big companies have already, they've got budgets for this already. So they're just replacing some of the consulting money with, with our automated solution. Uh, and, and then we're kind of gradually pushing out the, the consulting companies. Yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, so um, as we are also seeing that many of the new emerging technologies are catching up, like these days, 5G adaption is like really a hot topic. Um, companies like are releasing phones, which are like by default 5G, 5G enabled, right? But other brands uh, like Apple or and their iPhone, it might, the next version might have 5G support, but if it is taking too long, maybe Apple will delay it for the phone after the next one, right? And there right. is a possibility. So um, if we talk about AI and analytics um, and all of these things, can um, that be helpful uh, with the help of analytics like for these companies in gym operating at such a big scale to actually yes. make informed you, you asked a question earlier that I didn't fully respond to. So I explained automated market mix model and then you asked, so how can machine learning enhance it? So the way we're enhancing the, the, the traditional, so I mean, we, first of all, we automate the market mix modeling, which is a regression modeling approach. Mm -hmm. to automate yeah, it. Yeah. But what, what, we, what we also do is we're using machine learning to see sudden shifts, for example. There's, a, there's an area where machine learning makes a difference. We're also looking at machine learning to, to shrink the scope in which you run certain modeling because if you, uh, if you run, run modeling with no limitations, it can take very long to analyze. But if you say, okay, let's say we've done enough cases and enough iteration on analyzing retargeting. You are talking about something focused analysis. Which is like yeah, yeah. So, so we, we can use, let's say, let's take retargeting, which is a common piece of a mix for any company. Um, so when we've done enough analysis, uh, we can see that retargeting behaves in a certain way. So all of a sudden we can, we can for the coming cases, assume that we don't need to analyze retargeting in the full scope. We need to analyze it in a limited scope. So, so then we, we use retargeting to, to limit the scope of the analysis, which is actually making the results even better. And it, takes the, it makes the calculation time faster. So, so, so those are examples where machine learning is, is adding value to a, uh, an automated regression-based modeling or an automated econometrics model or marketing mix modeling, as, as we call it in the marketing world. Uh, so you're blending basically because machine learning alone cannot win over regression analytics. It just can't, not for, not for this area. Uh, but you can enhance the regression modeling with machine learning. That's really cool. Uh, right. And, 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 and there, are, there are certain areas that, that we're, that we're uh, moving into now, which is on top of automating the marketing mix. Based on the same capabilities, you can optimize the price, the price strategies, uh, you can optimize product launches, like you mentioned, some of the new smartphones supporting 5G, et cetera. So those have, those have uh, less history. So you, so you can do, okay, what are the ideal product launch mixes? Uh, and th those are things we're preparing. We're not doing them yet. We're preparing for them, but they are using similar uh, uh, calculation capabilities. We're also looking at, uh, at survival model, which, which survival modeling, which is really interesting for the B2B space, where we not only uh, run regression modeling, targeting uh, sales volumes, but actually also one deal. So we're running regression modeling to, to see what is required to win a deal, and do we see any patterns there? Uh, yeah, uh, that's helpful. Yeah. That's helpful. So Chris, thank you very, very much for taking up the time and talking to us about uh, the applications of AI analytics, as well as telling us more about automated market, marketing mix modeling. So once again, uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to having you sometime in the future. Thank you too. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. 
Thank you, Christopher and Naseeb, for your valuable time and educating us about how AI and analytics can be leveraged for B2B businesses. Thanks for listening to this episode by Better Tech. If you enjoyed this podcast, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share it across your favorite social networking platform. We look forward to bringing you the latest industry news in our next episode. In the meantime, take a look at our other episodes and hit subscribe with the links in the description box below so that you don't miss out on the latest in tech.